I'll, I'll speak English. Um, I'm a graduate student from the Central European University and I'm interested mainly in the Holocaust and Soviet Union and Poland. Um, my email thesis is about the impact of Soviet historiography on the um, early post-war Polish uh, Holocaust memory creation. So I would like to give uh, two examples first for my story. In March 2015, um, 199 euro was wanted uh, for the unknown seller on the Dutch eBay for a bar of soap, quote, made from the fat of Jewish Holocaust victims, end of quote. The auction was blocked, but no official statement was made about the authenticity of the sale object. Later same year, the Telegraph UK published news about a grand Great find in Poland. A few hundred pair of shoes were found in a forest near the former Nazi concentration camp Stutthof. The publication informed the public about, quote, brutal reputation of the camp, which was the site of Nazi experimentation into making soap from the fat of some of its thousands of victims, end of quote. Did the Nazis really make soap from the human corpses? One of the greatest myths of the Holocaust is still present in the public opinion, and it's still the source of anxious discussions. I will concentrate on Polish case mostly. I'll provide sources of the story and its background. How have academic scholarship responded to the problematic nature of the myth, and how it has been used by the Holocaust deniers? I will provide an example how famous Polish writer contributed into myth creation. And finally, I will introduce the new investigation on the issue organized recently by the Polish Institute for National Remembrance. The rumor that Germans were producing soap from human corpses was already popularized by British propaganda during World War I. During the World War II, the story appeared again in Auschwitz and other Nazi camps. During 1943-44, Professor Rudolf Spanner, the director of the Anatomical Institute in the Danzig Medical Academy, nowadays Gdańsk, Poland, regularly ordered human corpses from Danzig prison and from other places, including the Camp Stutthof. His laboratory assistant, Zygmunt Mazur, testified that apart from the preparations of skeletons for educational purposes for the academy, the professor ordered to leave the human fat and to prepare a soap-like substance from it. After the liberation of Gdańsk by the Red Army, the Soviet and Polish commissions inspected the institute. Um, they found the corpses of around 150 people, body parts, chemicals, and few pieces of what was thought to be soap. The Soviet report on the activities of the laboratory was presented to the Nuremberg trials in 1946. The investigation showed that even though a small amount of soap was produced from human fat. It was never done for commercial purposes. There was no order to begin the experiments, and the crux of the problem was the respect to dead bodies of those executed in prison and in the camp. Rudolf Spanner was released with a lack of evidence, and he died in 1960 and killed Germany. For many years after the war, the legend was used as an example of Nazi atrocities and became an integral part of the popular Holocaust narrative worldwide. Small bars of the soap taken from the concentration camps, which were not connected to the Danzig Institute, were buried in Romania and in Israel. This photo here is from Siget from the city uh, Elivisa is, is from, and this is still, this uh, me me memorial exists at the cemetery in Siget. Um, the general belief 
was and is still, I've asked people in Sigurd, they still believe it, that it was made from the human fat of victims killed by Nazis for the purpose of, um, of, doing, of making soap in order to improve the situation of, on the detergents market. These barrios created controversy and became targets for anti-Semitic hatred and Holocaust denial. The problematic character of the evidence resulted in the appearance of many reports and investigations by the Holocaust revisionists. Most importantly, they claim that popular rumors are popular also in academia. Unfortunately, the revisionist idea that the soap story was not doubted for many years after the war, and it has begun to be criticized lately, has a point. There were many reports by authoritative, authoritative scholars um, about the speculations on the soap myth. Uh, among others, a prominent historian, Yehuda Bauer, uh, suggests that, uh, quote, what Nazis did was horrendous enough. We do not need to believe in additional horrors they thought about but did not have time to realize, end of quote. Michael Bernbaum from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum confirms, quote, I didn't find any evidence of it. I found evidence of everything else what Nazis did and worse, end of quote. So does that mean the, the issue is resolved? Surprisingly, does not. The myth's continuity is certain, and it needs only a small push to gain popularity again. In this case, the push was from the Polish literature. A famous Polish writer, Zofia Nalkowska, joined one of the post-war commissions. Her testimony is known from the essay Professor Spanner in book Medallions. It was translated into many languages and was an obligatory school reading in Poland for many years. The essay is based on her own witnesses and uh, the materials from the Nuremberg trials. It is written in an emotional report-like style describing the terrible procedure and the contents of the Spanner's laboratory. And it has a stunning effect on the reader. The story suggests a, a large-scale practice. Nalkowska gives a number of 350 corpses, which is twice more than, than the official report. And in my opinion, is a serious exaggeration. She was following, following the tendency of the communist propaganda to create a terrifying picture of Nazi atrocities and also the inner necessity of a writer to give a shocking piece of post-trauma literature. In Polish public opinion, Nalkowska's story is a true report of Nazi crimes, but not necessarily a story about the Holocaust. For instance, one of the main characters in her description is the headless body of a man with a tattoo in Polish, God is with us. Her cross-national narrative supports the competitive nature of the Polish perception of the Holocaust. There have been attempts to marginalize the Holocaust in Poland, and this is used nowadays to achieve the political aims. The Institute for National Remembrance, uh, in Polish it's Institut Pamięci Narodowe, and I will use this uh, short IPN form, uh, is a Polish research institute uh, with illustration prerogatives and prosecution powers forms on the basis of the Commission for the Investigation of Crimes Against Polish Nation. The name which uh, certainly points uh, to the main focus of the institution. It was already blamed for politicizing the history before and perfectly reflects tendencies in the Polish government. During 2002-2006, IPN conducted a new investigation on the Soap case. Professor Andrzej Stoichwo was the only expert who undertook the issue, which even FBI laboratories refused to investigate because of the lack of technologies. Published results provoked a wave of media attention, quote, soap from human fat is a historical truth, end of quote. From the expertise of the sample taken from the laboratory of Dr. Spanner, um, it was proven that it contains human fat and only a trace amount of cowley, the substance which could be added 
in order to make it usable for cleaning purposes. And it is the only evidence that the substance was produced as a soap. The case was remitted, but the scandalized story attracted the attention again. Polish investigation did not add anything to the previous perspective, but the sensitive attention of Polish society to Second World War crimes feeds the popularity of the Holocaust myths. The popular misconceptions affected even the important institutions like the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum, which published the, on their official website the results of IPN's investigation without any additional comment. IPN reactivated the investigation after some publications blaming Zofia Naukowska for creating a fake Professor Spanier's story for communist propaganda. They set out to defend the legendary Polish writer, but as a result, they defended the popular delusion. Although the results were far from the sensational, IPN, with the help of mainstream Polish media, succeeded in creating the impression that the case was clearly pro proven. Quote, IPN prosecutors are convinced the soap was from the people. End of quote. Was it uh, an inclination to fire up the sensation or the institute was motivated by other kind of political objectives? In Poland, as in many other post-communist countries, the past has become uh, primarily a weapon of struggle on the domestic and the foreign policy front. The irresponsible position of Polish researchers and the media chase for the loud headlines can cost research extra years of struggling with the overthrow of this harmful myth. And last thing I would like to mention is um, one of the rare examples of the uh, efficient use of the myth for educational purposes is the American play titled The Soap Myth by Jeff Cohen from 2009. This provocative and sophisticated play reflects on a thin line between survivors' memories and the historical objectivity. It highlights something that is not included in a critical approach to facts and Holocaust denial, the emotions of survivors and those who emphasize a need to believe in absolute evil, the need to trust the testimonies and retain the beliefs which were functioning the society for many years and were important for remembering the catastrophe as cruel as it was. That's all. Thank you very much for listening. Спасибо большое. А можно один вопрос? Хорошо. А вот вы как считаете, может быть, есть ли у вас мнение? А как вообще как бы прерывать эту мыльную оперу, чтобы это не продолжалось еще лет 50? Нужны однозначные усилия мирового научного сообщества для того, чтобы популяризировать публикации. Я не включила это в свой, в свой доклад, но это есть, будет в публикации после конференции. К сожалению, очень мало опубликованных работ на эту тему. Практически единицы. Так что ну, на эту тему нужно писать, и нужно публиковать, и нужно проводить какую-то образовательную деятельность среди населения. Да, да, пожалуйста, Марк. Спасибо. Правильно ли я понял фактуру, просто подтвердите или опровергните, если я неправильно понял, что были эксперименты профессора Шпанера, что он действительно пытался создавать из человеческого жира, из трупов, пытался создавать мыло, несколько, так сказать, там кусков вот какого-то реального мыла было, но не было именно массового производства и не было использования там заключенных концлагерей для производства такого мыла в массовом порядке. Спасибо за вопрос. Это очень проблемная, э, на самом деле, вещь, потому что здесь вопрос, верим ли мы во все э, свидетельства, которые записаны в э, Нюрнберге. То есть э, сам доктор утверждал, что эта субстанция была сделана для того, чтобы там э, смазывать э, суставы вот этих скелетов, которые приготовлялись для студентов Академии. Единственное мнение о мыле – это то, что было записано советскими 
прокурорами со слов Зигмунда Мазера еще трех боже, prisoners of war, плен, военнопленных, которые работали там. То есть мы не знаем, была ли это правда, мы не узнаем никогда. Потому что единственная информация только вот в этом советском репорте, э, репортаж, ну, э, отчете, да, и очень многие обвиняют его в нестыковке фактов. То есть там очень много вопросов. Понятно, спасибо большое. Так, Арон Штейр, вы хотите, и на этом, к сожалению, нам придется прерывать вопросы. Большой комментарий для тех, кто, может быть, просто не знает. Я сотрудник Едвашем, и поэтому мне приятно было, что прозвучало абсолютное отрицание подобного существа, существования подобного мыла ведущим историком Едвашемом Егуда Бауром. И то, что вы показали на фотографии захоронения останков человека, людей, евреев, погибших в виде кусков мыла, это абсолютно частный акт был проведен, и государство к этому исследовательский центр не имел никакого отношения. А вот в дополнение к тому, что вы сказали о человеческом жире, есть абсолютно неопубликованные, неизвестные, но у меня есть эта рукопись, воспоминания э, с, э, фельдшера э, Ривира Бухенвальда, то есть... Э, госпиталя Бухенвальда, советского военнопленного, который, рассказывая об ужасах Бухенвальда и рассказывая, в общем, далеко не ту картину, которая нам известна, а получается достаточно, кстати, по сравнению с другими лагерями, благостная картина, госпиталь Ривир Бухенвальда имел такое оборудование, которое не имели многие советские клиники до войны, это тоже правда, да? Это воспоминания, поэтому из-за этой правды его не хотели публиковать. А мне переслал его сын эти воспоминания, написанные в советское время. Так вот он вместе с тем свидетельствует, чтобы не создалось такое благостное впечатление о том Бухенвальде, о котором он же пишет, некоторые крыши бараков Бухенвальда смазывались человеческим жиром, добытым после сжигания тел в крематории. То есть вот такое, что фашизм, лицо фашизма стало бы понятно. Это две вещи, которые сопрягались. Простите, Спасибо. пожалуйста, а как можно жир добыть после сжигания <связывания> тела в крематории? <связывания> Он выплавляется, процесс сжигания не моментально, жир стекает на некотором этапе. Арон, это проблема. Я понимаю, но у нас да, нет времени обсудить времени подобные это, да. технологические но, случае, детали. Но, во всяком случае, этими свидетельствами, если потребуется, я могу поделиться. Извините. Я могу поделиться. Вот. Спасибо большое. Чудовищная совершенно ситуация. Спасибо вам за хороший доклад.